Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so happy to be here. For folks I get to see often, um, it's been a month since I've been here, which I think is the longest I've like not been um, sitting with Sangha for years and years. And uh, yeah, I feel it. It really, it really, uh, I felt like there was a sense of kind of untethering and disconnection and just really happy to be here with you all. And if it's your first time, you know, that's great. You don't know that I haven't been here and uh, no problem, no problem. This is the Well of Being Wednesday and we are super fortunate to be hosted here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, this is a entirely volunteer run center. So there are many volunteers here in the room, many volunteers who are not here, but it's their effort, their care, and their generosity that we are able to gather here together. So beautiful to have that. And the intention of the center is to create space for community and to share the Dharma and teachings. And in order for us to do that and to come together on a weekly basis, you have to be adaptable to things changing and also really hold in utmost integrity the dharma as every part of what we're doing here. And so that means that through our body, our speech, and our mind, we're adhering as closely as possible to the ethic of non-harming. And by that, I mean when we are having that inclination towards kind of criticism of ourselves or criticism of others, we just lean into the compassion. And part of what we do here at Dharma Collective is I will lead a guided practice. There'll probably be an extended preamble, which I apologize for in advance. We will talk about um, the book, which we're starting a new book tonight. Very exciting. And we also engage in discussion and question and answer. And doing so is a little, um, in some ways, risky, right? It's kind of easy to be sage on the stage, just telling you stuff then there's no room for awkwardness or um, confusion, but it's not actually how we learn and how we deepen and how we create community. And knowing um, some of the beautiful people in this room, you all have so much you're offering in your reflections and in your questions. But in order for us to do that, I really, really want to, again, emphasize we have to be in body, speech, and mind, really infused with compassion and care for one another. And so for the kind of time that we're here, we could almost think of one another as Dharma family, you know, or spiritual friends. And, you know, just like family, there's dysfunction sometimes. We don't always do it right. But to hold each other with that sense of, wow, everybody is here in order to try to wake up a little more, and to be a little more kind, and to be able to be a little more in touch with our own heart living in this world. So that's that's our our goal here at the Dharma Collective to create that kind of shared space together. It's always evolving, we're always learning. So whenever there is an opportunity for us to learn from you about how we can do it better, we also would love to hear that. Um, and so before we start, can all the volunteers in the room just raise their hands so people would know who to go to if they wanted to share something? Okay, thanks. We love you. Much appreciated. And hi, friends online. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you. So tonight we're we're starting this text. I, maybe some people in the room are familiar with the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. It is, you know, this ancient 8th century text, and it is so quoted. Like, there's definitely a couple pieces in this book that are very well known, and you're like, oh, I've heard that before. And there's a lot of it that is a little bit of kind of a hard slog, hard work to really look at these texts and understand what the message is trying to transmit. But what's so beautiful and simple about these teachings is they really help us do what I think many of us are struggling to do right now, which is to live with an open heart in this world that is on fire. And to do that, you know, requires everyday practice for sure. And not just practice, not just kind of doing, you know, what needs to get done to stabilize the heart and mind, but to really shift and change our outlook on the world and our point of view and perspective. The 
guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, I mean, first, probably important to define, like, what is a Bodhisattva, this term? And in the simplest of ways to describe it, it's a warrior of compassion. So someone who is, you know, dedicated to creating more compassion in this world by any means necessary. And when we do that, <laughs> it means that we have to not succumb to despair, not become overwhelmed by rage. It's not that we don't feel those experiences, but we learn how to um, kind of train the heart and mind. And I think what's really interesting um, for me, I didn't know about the Guide to the Bodhisattva work and teachings when I became the most burnt out as like a frontline healthcare provider. And I didn't know there was a way to give with this kind of orientation of the responsibility to clarify heart and mind before we give or as we give to others. And I think that that allows us to sustain what is the natural generosity of our heart. Like for most of us, like we care, we don't even have to try. And then we get a little beat down by caring and then we're like coming, coming back. And, you know, this, these teachings, they really help us um, cultivate um, what is, what is described as all inclusive compassion. So compassion, not only for folks who we know actually um, are suffering, but actually the suffering we don't even know. So not just making space for the compassion that's kind of, kind of blatant, which is hard enough, but just this attitude of like my stance towards this world, just as it is, is compassion. And the other side of that is to cultivate an, the unbiased wisdom mind. So both of those are really important, kind of just this all inclusive sense of compassion. And then the mind that sees so clearly how things are. It's almost like lifting up the invisible net that connects each of us to each of us to everything of all times. And when you lift that up clearly, I mean, compassion is the only rational response. You know, so it comes through both ways. And we can um, kind of work in both directions. We can cultivate that sense of the unbiased wisdom mind by finding a way to feel a spaciousness of awareness, an openness of awareness in which everything can come and go and everything has its um, kind of understood pattern and connection to everything else. And we can also practice it in this like deliberate compassion, like generating compassion. So the kind of revealing of what's there and the generating of what we want to cultivate. And tonight for our practice, for our first practice, we'll go over the course of this book, we'll probably go back and forth. Practices more intended to help us with this, um, you know, kind of polishing the inner lens or finding the wisdom mind. And then practices that kind of amplify compassion that's already here. And so tonight we'll start really with the compassion practice. And I'm sure many, if not all of you in the room have had a compassion practice at some point. But I think it's worth kind of going through what the steps are of the practice, because sometimes it can feel like a lot. And compassion practice includes visualization. It includes holding things in mind and even like choosing things. What are we going to practice compassion for? And sometimes we get a little caught up. It's like too much to do. So I'd like to just walk us through the steps and then practice together. Um, and step one is sometimes forgotten, and, and I should mention this, by the way. Um, I'll talk more about the original author, um, Shanti Deva, but we are working with a translation by Pema Chodron, who probably many of you know, because she is such a, um, yeah, a teacher whose words make it very easy to connect with the Dharma. And she has a way that she teaches a compassion practice of really starting the practice by flashing on the wisdom of emptiness, which is very beautiful and poetic, but for most of us, very difficult to achieve. But the idea is we start by recognizing that everything changes. And we start by recognizing that the compassion we need is already in us. So the way we will do that together is a bit more on the really recognizing and, and kind of tuning into all of the compassion we've experienced in this life all the compassion we've extended in this life. 
So that's kind of the, that's the ground floor of what we'll be doing, step one. And then um, step two is actually, you know, sometimes it's called making suffering blatant. But we have to find that um, way where the pain and the difficulty of the world feels real to us. Because when it feels real to us, then we get that natural inclination of the heart. So the definition of compassion that um, I really appreciate and often use, just a really simple one, is you know the the heartfelt aspiration of alleviating suffering when in the face of suffering. And often that's described as the heart's quivering in the face of suffering. And that heart quivering requires that we recognize the suffering. All of us have had to, by necessity, not see suffering sometimes to kind of build the callus around, you know, that feet, that like everyday onslaught of suffering. And so in this, what we do is we actually kind of like invite ourselves to really to feel and to make real and blatant um, the critical need for compassion through seeing suffering. And so that is something might be worthwhile. We're really going to work with one target of compassion tonight. So is there someone in your life right now, specifically and especially, whose suffering is blatant and real? And that is a person that we can then work with and kind of generate that compassion for. We won't stop there, but we will start there. So we are feeling our capacity for compassion, identifying it, making it real through uh, one being. And then the third step is that kind of real aspiration or kind of generating this feeling of care and compassion. And when we generate it, it's, you know, almost a sense of like the heart expanding and extending, like feeling that our compassion really, it's <clears throat> unbreakable, you know, indestructible, that we can extend it towards suffering without end. You know, and that is a little bit of a leap of faith to be able to do that, because sometimes it feels like I can't care more. But in this um, configuration, in the way that compassion is described here, it's just like our, our natural state of care without doing, without trying to fix, without trying to change. One of the more famous lines is without any hope of fruition. So we open ourselves to compassion, caring that another be free without an expectation of how that looks. And in that way, we can be restful with our compassion. Then the next step is to really, we've generated it and then we extend it. We're like radiating that compassion out. And sometimes we do that with words. I'll offer some words. For some folks, the words feel kind of a little dry or like, oh, that those words are not the words I would use. So please feel free and I'll, I'll instruct us to do this, feels to, to not use those words. Because um, sometimes it's just a feeling. Sometimes it's just an image. Um, it can be a very kind of personal and unique way. And then, so we've done, you know, we've done this practice. We will expand our compassion. So we'll repeat it one more time, that generation phase and that extension phase. And then the very last aspect of our compassion practice here is kind of resting in the field of unconfigured awareness, resting in the field of what happens once compassion has been so um, made alive that it's saturating our awareness and we rest in that awareness. So very often when we sit down to practice, we'd like to just sit down and have some space, have a little feeling of the inner refuge of our mind, heart, and body. But there's all the stuff, all the things we care about, all the things we worry about that's so alive. And so it's interesting to explore in our compassion practices is sometimes by bringing forth the difficulty and the pain and generating that sense of care and extending it, we have more access to that natural, luminous, spacious quality of mind. So we kind of take advantage of that at the end of our practice, so generating the compassion and then resting in that more unconfigured awareness. So that's a tour of what we're going to be doing here, probably about 20 or 30 minutes. And then, especially for folks who are new, there is bathrooms and tea that you can use pretty much anytime, except not during the practice if possible, just so we can 
um, maintain a bit of form here. And, you know, especially for folks who are new, but for everyone, you know, this is a different configuration than has ever been in this room here tonight. And for some folks, it's very new um, and uncertain. So I'd love to just start by giving people a chance to just kind of like look around this room and really see where we are and, you know, see where we're on the way out. Like, okay, there's the exit. So we have Jimmy at the door who's keeping us protected and safe from anyone who wants to come in and just, yeah, you know, like this is a completely new group. Not everyone here has been here before in this way. And to, you know, take that in as part of the practice, right? Being embodied and in person in our practice, it can be such a wonderful way to help us feel stable and regulated and can also take a little time to kind of come into our sense of body and place together. And finding a posture that feels supportive let me just check in. Friends online, you all can hear me well enough? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. And our posture is so important in this practice. It's really nice to feel the sense of the upright spine. Kind of our, it's like our main point that we can build practice around. And so you can take a little time to really feel the uprightness of the spine and find where it feels most at ease. Maybe that's a little farther forward than we would have expected. We can experiment with leaning back a little or side and to side. Really finding that spot where the a sense of uprightness, almost dignity to our posture. And it's perfectly fine to have the eyes closed or slightly open. And finding a place where the hands are either resting on the lap, or folded in the lap, that makes the neck and shoulders not feel too strained. to give us this most clear sense of the upright spine. It's sometimes instructed to have the chin just sloped gently towards the chest a bit. And invite a real softening in the eyes. Almost as though they were being unplugged, no longer needed to scan the world, no longer needed to receive. It's the inner vision and presence. And softening through the jaw and the chest and the belly. And with the sound of the bell to begin the practice, see if you can notice an invitation to bring attention and awareness inward.
beginning by settling the body in its natural state, by finding a sense of deep stillness in the body. Of course, there's subtle movement and undulation, both in the energies of the body and as the breath comes and goes through inhale and exhale. But just inviting or imagining that quality of deep stillness in the body of its natural state. And settling the inner speech by feeling or imagining that we could move towards the inner silence. Of course, there are thoughts and memories and images, inner narration. But we preference or put forth this idea of inner silence. And it can be helpful to do so by following the breath really noticing the full cycle of breath, of inhale and exhale. Just a couple more breaths here. Of course, we get carried away. No problem. Just coming back and seeing if we can stay with even one cycle of breath. Fully riding the breath with our attention. And then maybe naturally we find ourselves settling the mind in its natural state. Openness, spaciousness, and warmth. This is the mind heart that is at ease, rooted in the stillness of body, and the silence of speech, a natural flowering. This could feel almost like leaning back in the mind looking up at the stars, just that sense of vastness, but also warmth, a natural state of mind. And if it doesn't feel available in this moment, no problem, just try it out.
And then we shift from these practices of settling into body, speech, and mind into the practice of compassion, which invites, invites mind, visualization, imagination. And we begin by this phase in which we recognize, imagine the sense of compassion already in us. And so taking a moment and feeling this body as a body of compassion, quite literally made up of all of the compassion we have received in this lifetime. Feeling and imagining the smiles, the support, the care, all the compassion that has allowed us to survive and thrive. All the compassion we've received from beings who are no longer here, beings right here now in our life. This may be a felt sense in the body. Maybe there's images or memories of compassion, but just a couple moments to begin and take measure of all the compassion that is literally woven within this body. Still feeling the presence of that acknowledgement and experience of compassion right here. We bring to mind all of the compassion we've extended in this lifetime. All of the many beings we've loved and supported, cared for. Feeling that as also part of this body and this heart. And though the heart may have been strained or broken, feel and imagine the compassion that continues to flow and to generate that indestructible heart of compassion. And for just a moment or two, feeling the stability, the trustworthiness of this body of compassion. Allowing ourselves to be anchored here before we extend compassion to others. And while really having ourselves in this posture, in this embodiment of compassion, we can shift now to bringing to mind a being in our life whose suffering we can make very real, very blatant. It helps us open that quivering heart. And so taking a couple minutes and just thinking of this being and their difficulty, their struggles, but doing so from this rooted, embodied place of compassion that's always already here. As we bring this being to mind, it could be as though we see them in front of us, 
Maybe we have a memory of them and their difficulties. This is, of course, not entirely who they are, but just one part of what they're holding. Then we start to generate that heartfelt aspiration, that desire to somehow alleviate or at least help carry the difficulty, the challenge, the struggle, the suffering. Notice how that aspiration might feel in the body. The quality of sensations, where it might be located. I'm taking a moment, and again, whatever is felt or not felt is fine. Seeing if we can touch in to that desire that arises in the face of the suffering of another being. Can we feel that desire, that compassionate aspiration, <laughs> banning the flame? And then we remember our breath. And as we breathe in, we feel that aspiration of compassion. And as we breathe out, we feel that aspiration of compassion. And bringing to mind this being on our inhale, we extend and radiate compassion on our exhale. For a couple moments, just feeling this. Maybe we sense it as light or care, as openness. Breathing in, bringing this person vividly to mind. Exhale. May you be free from inner and outer harm. May you know peace and ease. May you be healthy and strong. Once again, inhaling, bringing this being to mind. And exhale, extending these wishes. May you be free from inner and outer harm. May you know peace and ease. May you be healthy and strong. And continuing with the rhythm of your breath and with the words that feel right for you or no words at all. Just that opening and extension of the heart. If at any point it feels like there's too much Suffering feels too big. You can just come back to the breath, putting a hand on the belly, regrounding, refinding the body of compassion. And for just a couple more breaths, really feeling this generous heart of compassion. giving our full attention and focus to compassionate aspiration.
And then releasing the image of this being and taking a moment to reconnect with the body, the breath. <laughs> Seeing if we can feel the strength of compassion. There's the tenderness, the shakiness, and also this, the strength of meeting and being with this heartfelt aspiration of care. And then we take one more step, extending the sphere of our compassion and care and imagining whatever is the suffering or difficulty of this being, that this is shared by so many other beings. Of course, it's unique to them, but it's something other beings may struggle with as well, whether it's mental health or financial concerns physical issues, challenging relationship, and letting our mind and heart just expand to all the other beings who also may be struggling. Seeing if we can ignite, use that fire of our care, and just imagining that we could extend compassion to all beings also holding the same difficulty or struggle. Also who need our care and support. And once again, on the inhale, bringing to mind other beings who are struggling in the same way. And on the exhale, may all these beings be free from inner and outer harm. May all these other beings also know peace and ease, feel healthy and strong. Radiating out with the exhale is compassion. It's okay if it feels less poignant or strong. It's an exercise and a practice. Just recognizing and including this capacity for compassion to those unknown. Those two or three more breaths here, either using the words or the feeling, bringing in and extending and radiating out that heart of compassion. One last exhale, and then just resting in this field of compassion that has been generated, allowing the mind to feel at ease and spacious, body to feel at ease and spacious. Feeling this body as a body of compassion.
whenever a thought, memory, or image arises, it's leaning back once again in the mind, feeling and experiencing the body of compassion, heart of compassion, compassion infusing our awareness, but without any target, just open, spacious, clear awareness which in its very nature is compassion. When you hear the bell, see if you can maintain some sense of this spacious, compassionate awareness in body, heart, and mind. Thank you for your practice. So we usually take a little time here for questions and reflections. Uh, for folks in the room, we use this mic because it doesn't amplify you, but it does um, allow friends at home to hear. And yeah, any questions on the practice or reflections on the practice You'd be willing to share in a more or less pithy way. And then all of us get to practice that wonderful, compassionate listening, right? And really consider, can I listen from the heart? Can I listen with compassion? Um, earlier, some of us were talking about when you're on retreat and you start to really see the depth of your judgment of others, right? So always can be alchemical fuel for our fire of awakening. But yeah, questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so as you were talking about compassion, you talked about restfulness, resting in your compassion. And I was, for some reason I was thinking previously when we talked about compassion, there was some relationship to action. Mm. And so I wondered if you could expand on the relationship between compassion and doing versus restfulness. Yeah. Can I ask you a question first? Sure. Did you feel a sense of resting and or what was that like? Well, yeah, I did. I rem well, I reminded myself to, to uh, feel the compassion without the compulsion to do. Yes. Which is nice, but but also <laughs> and I and uh, I I um that wasn't natural. Yeah. For me. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, I'm sure many people have that same uh, association with compassion as it's doing, and I really like to think of compassion practice as you know it's especially this. Um, I mean, does 
Does extending it count as doing, like in this, or not really? Does, does extending it count as doing? Yeah, like when we send it to someone in practice. Uh, that, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Very often we think of compassion as action, as what we're doing in the world. And it's wonderful when that's the case. But so often there is so much suffering, there is absolutely nothing we can do. Or we burn our gears out trying to do with a certain expectation of how it will go. So we also need to be cultivating a sense of compassion that's kind of more like a stance or a readiness so that when the opportunity arises, when we can act skillfully, we've been practicing. So what I've noticed in, in working in the arenas of like burnout for a number of years, not just as someone who's been burnt out, but like in training and burnout, a lot of the ways I see people um, struggle with compassion as a stance is it feels like you're not helping if you're not doing anything, right? Or controlling it or, or making it so. But there's, you know, often these cases where we can't do it. And so what we then, we then are like, well, if I can't help, I'm going to kind of shut down my empathy. Or if I can't help, I'm going to like blame that other person or get lost in despair. Or like, you know, there's all these ways that when we can't tolerate just being in compassion, we act weird. We get weird about it. You know, we can't just be like, there is suffering. I wish I could help. And I can't. It's like, there is suffering. I wish I could help why do they keep suffering? They should receive my care or they don't even want it or they don't deserve it. Right. And so compassion, I really think like, I love the idea of being a compassion warrior. That's like, you're all like the warrior. I mean, I'm not sure how pro battlefields I am, but the warrior is not always on the battlefield, right? They are like training like way more than they're out. And so I really think these compassion practices, they're like helping us keep the heart open. That's the real trick because it can shut down so easily under despair, under anger, under just not care. So, yeah. Follow up question. So that makes sense. <clears throat> and you also said that you're, you know, when you're ready or you stand ready. Yeah. Which implies that there is a time yeah. to act. Of course. But that's unrelated to compassion or how you is can, it related? You can always, there's all, not always, but um, whenever, like, whenever it's possible to act in our compassion, a hundred percent, we should, mm -hmm. you know, and if we could always, then that would be great. It just is not the case. You know, the person who I brought to mind, man, I'd love to help them. They won't receive it no matter how many times I've tried. Right. And so what can I do? I can be like, well, whatever with them, like I'm, they're not available, but I can practice compassion and it helps me be less judgmental and cynical and kind of like over them. Right. And especially with the people in our lives who are truly toxic and harmful, right. We can't like do a lot to help them, but we can cultivate and sustain and keep generating compassion, but it kind of shifts what we're doing it for. Like often we're like, I'm doing compassion for that person. We're actually doing it for ourselves. So we may be available and open. And there's a point at which we no longer have to do or try. Compassion becomes super reflexive. It's like how, and like, I think on our best days, all of us are like that. You're not like, someone's suffering I should care like there's just that <laughs> you know that like care that like reservoir of care um it's just it's just hard the volume of suffering the intensity of suffering um for some of us close for some of us farther away it it's really it's like I like this like I can't attitude like I just can't um that's not a compassionate attitude right so Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Jimmy. You're going to have to repeat it. Okay. Okay. I'll repeat it. Yeah. The people, you can probably hear me. <laughs> we can. Um, a lot of times, the most compassionate thing that I can do is not be making stories up about other people. Yes. Even the people that deserve my compassion the most, sometimes I make these, I make up stories yeah. that are way, way, I mean, overtly not compassionate. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then other times, maybe a little covertly unkind. Yeah. In the guise of being kind. Yeah. But they're just not. Yeah. You know? So it's 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 probably most helpful for me to try my best to not be making up stories about other people or when I do to realize it and to try to step away from that tendency and to pay attention to them enough, to actually pay attention to them enough to see what's really going on. Yeah. As opposed to the story. Yeah. Yeah. And for folks online, if you didn't hear that, just one of the most compassionate things you can do is to not make up stories about another's suffering. And and I think there's a really beautiful point in that too, which is we don't even actually need to know the story. You know, that point at which we open, you know, the sphere of our concern. And it's like, so, you know, my friend who's, who I was thinking about, who won't receive my care, whatever it is. And how many people just like them are struggling and suffering, right? And that we don't even need to know the story. We can still generate care. And sometimes the story, as Jimmy was saying, can be like really covertly like pity. And pity is like a looking down on like, oh, sorry for you, right? It's a, it's not your equal, right? And with compassion, we're not enacting compassion because we feel bad for others. We're enacting compassion because they are us, right? And whether or not you believe this, I think it's a really beautiful idea coming out of the Buddhist cosmology that at some point in this, at some point, every single being, you know, not just humans, but um, other beings has been like our mother in another lifetime. And if we really start to have that as some kind of ground, like even if we don't believe that, like, what if, right? And uh, we all, a lot of us have complicated relationships with our moms, but still <laughs> this idea of like someone who brought life to us and, and brought us here like that's just a really wild way of looking around the world. Like, oh, wow, okay. You know, if we think about how many lifetimes we've had or how many beings, um, and it is, it's a way of having compassion that's so much about our deep interbeing, not about like, I'm such a good compassionate person. It's like, no, I just clearly see like how, like what is the other option? because I recognize that we're all connected and we all are, right? <laughs> like, even if you don't want to go Buddhist cosmology, you just want to go physics. We all are. So it is kind of the only sane option, but it does, it can feel very disempowering to just feel compassion and not enact compassion. So I hope, um, yeah, I hope that there's a sense of what we're doing it for. Like, why are we sitting with our eyes closed practicing compassion? It's not to make ourselves feel better about the suffering in the world. It's to create that readiness for when we actually have the ability to help. So, great. Any other questions or reflections on practice? Yes, Tara. Thanks. Um, what do you think about, like, I guess I have this experience where, like, I cannot feel the compassion like it's just like like emptiness yeah i mean i can desire to have compassion i can hope that i have compassion or like like there's like conceptualizing of compassion like intellectualizing but then like when it when i try to yeah. feel there's like it's like nothing um, and I don't, and I don't think I'm burnt out. I mean, yeah. it kind of sounds like I'm burnt out, but <laughs> like, um, yeah, I was kind of like toggling through like people that I, like, I guess like typically, but it's like the, the feeling actually isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. And that could be like anything. Like I'm just like tired or something, but like, you know, or it's I like been frequently cool. experienced this. So. Yeah. Um, frequently experience it like in compassion practice. Yeah. What about in like the everyday when, I mean, I know part of your work is being with a lot of suffering. Yeah. And so like, I think what drives me is anger over injustice mm -hmm. and like really raging to fix stuff for people who like don't normally have somebody to do that for them or something yeah. like that. Um, 
it's like anger and rage of yeah. justice that drives me. It's not necessarily like the feeling of compassion. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I mean, compassion has 999 arms, right? Okay. So I think like, <laughs> like and some of them are the like, let me embrace you. And some of them are like that fierce. Okay. Right? Yeah, okay. And so I think, and, but I think it's interesting that the sentiment or feeling, cause sometimes Sometimes for me, and like, yeah, I don't know if it's like hormones or like diet or what, but sometimes it's like, oh my God, like I can feel it. And sometimes it's more like an energy and it's less like a sentiment. And, you know, I've had, I've like cried through compassion practices and some teachers or teachings will say, you know, if you're sad, you're not doing it right. And I'm like, no, I don't, <laughs> there's no doing it right. Right. There's like practicing. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it not feeling alive because it's, it's a practice, right? And it still is doing the thing. And then, you know, just in general, like side note on rage, um, which I think can be obviously a very powerful tool in, in work and in activism and like to be able to apply compassion to our rage like, sometimes so that it doesn't become like it because it's like still that pilot light for us, but not the raging fire that makes us feel like burnt, you know? And so, and that's a tough one because, you know, that rage, especially when it's around justice, um, it really is like the power and force of compassion, right? Like it's infused with it. It's like, it's an inactive version of it, but it can also become like kind of contorted with the blame. And that makes such a dualism and it can really exhaust the mind. Like, why the fuck is this happening? Why is it still mm -hmm. happening? Wait, no, it's still happening, right? You know, we just get um, no rest for our mind. And so when we have compassion for ourselves, it's not, not like um, it's taking the focus away from the injustice, which can feel very edgy. Like, I can't do that. Like, I need to keep focusing on what's wrong and keep working on it. But that moment of like, wow, this anger and rage is exhausting me right now. I, my heart cares and I want things to be a much better version of the world than they are. And for me personally, that matters and is hard. Like that's really edgy for most folks working in, in like frontline positions and activism to like take that moment towards us. But it is a very like nurturing step. And then you go right back you know, to the way that compassion wants to move through you, whether it's the kind of heartfelt um, soothing and calming or, or treating or that kind of like intense energy that's motivating. So there's not, it's not like required that I actually feel it in my body and my heart area. No, because I bet you do sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and it'd be, it'd be curious, like if you notice and like, you know, for our little furry friends, for example, yeah, it can be, it's like, I do fate for my dog. It's true. Right? I'm saying. No human. <laughs> Humans are more complicated. They are. Yeah. But like to find that wherever it naturally, like I love Pema talks a lot about these on the spot practices. Like whenever like the heart gets squeezed and just say, oh, may you be free from inner and outer harm. May you know ease, like just seeing it and like practicing it on the spot, such a beautiful way. We don't need to do it in, in this formal way. So, yeah. I think there's a seat here. You're good. You're doing the standing thing. Oh, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out with Jimmy. Yeah. Um, so I, I do compassion practice when there's somebody that's, there's suffering going on, right? Okay. And so earlier I heard you mention that, you know, we didn't, we don't do compassion practice to make ourselves feel better but a lot of times when i do them i do feel better and is that okay <laughs> not okay go back and do i figure so so you have to cry yeah. that's if you're right yeah no okay i mean i and i it's not that it's not for like it's for the other person and for us right so that we can keep going you know because like caring for others who are suffering like it does require that we can kind of keep ourselves, um, yeah, nourished in a way. And compassion practice can be super nourishing. Even works any for others, it feels good for us. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Happy to be back. All right. Any other questions or reflections, please? 
can we hand this back? Hi. Is there a difference between compassion and empathy? Mm -hmm. Could you explain? I could. I mean, but I last week I was at this um, International Society for Contemplative Research, which is like all my nerd friends in the world and all the like scientists who are meditation practitioners who study the mind and consciousness. And man, did we debate on this one. Um, so I'm just going to tell you my point of view, but I will say there are some different points of view that also think they're right. Uh, <laughs> but we we mostly agree. Um, and again, this is drawing from like lived experience, psychotherapy, and then uh, neuroscience, and like really looking at the components of compassion and empathy. And with empathy, it's like, it's this more immediate uh, resonance, like an emotional resonance with someone who's struggling or, or having a hard time. And then there's an appraisal that happens which is, you know, kind of like what's going on for them? Why is this happening? And our empathy, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. So yeah, like uh, getting a text from a friend who says like, I'm really going through it and having a hard time. So we have that kind of immediate emotional resonance with this like, oh, wow, someone I care about is going through a hard time. And then there's the appraisal of it. And the appraisal can lead to compassion. Like, oh, I need to reach out and see how they're doing. But the appraisal could also be, I can't believe they got back together with their ex. This is their problem, right? Or the appraisal could be, I just can't handle how hard this is for them, which is called self-related concern or despair. So empathy can lead to compassion, um, but it also can lead to these other aspects that are actually not compassionate. And then if we have compassion without empathy, it can be a little misguided. The empathy actually helps us see and understand like what the suffering is about. So that's, that's how I work. And if um, you look up my name and like empathy education, there's a free online paper. We wrote about it a couple of years back that you can look for my point of view. <laughs> we talk about other points of view at another time. Yeah. So is compassion without empathy like sort of going towards pity? Compassion without empathy can it can still be really good, but it might not be well targeted. Like I think of a great example of like, um, you know, you hear that you know someone's having a hard time and you like send them chicken soup, but they're a vegetarian. Um, or like, it's just like a compat or like you do something that you think is like, it's coming from your compassion, but it's not informed by empathy. Like you haven't actually paid attention. Okay. Let's get to Shanti Deva slash Pema Chodron. Um, I love the storytelling of this book. So I, um, so I didn't just do this all this week. I've like read this book so many times. I love it so much. I feel like it's been such a, um, guiding light for me. Uh, and I always find new things, which is fun. So I'm really excited to read it with you all. I think the last time we did it in some form of this sitting group was in, oh my God, do you know much longer? Way before 2018. I don't think even 19. Yeah. Anyway, a while ago, so it'll be brand new, but this idea, um, that Pema Chodron kind of wanted to offer is like commentary on this eighth century text that makes it feel more alive for today. And she said, it's, you know, she said a couple things in this first introductory chapter that are so beautiful, um, kind of really inspire, like, why, why should we look at this eighth century text? Like there's a, a lot that's different in the world than that was happening back then. And one of the things she describes and um, talks about, she says, I regard this text as an instruction manual for extending ourselves to others, a guide a guidebook for compassionate action. We can read it to free ourselves from crippling habits and confusion, and we can read it to encourage our wisdom and compassion to grow stronger. We read it with the motivation to share the benefit with everyone we meet. So he said, not everything will inspire you, and you might find the languaging challenging, and you feel provoked or offended, but remembering that the intention is to encourage us. So Shantideva was a prince in the 8th century, and um, 
there's a, a couple accounts, we'll never know what's true, that the night before he was supposed to become king, he left um, in order to seek the spiritual path. And some say it was because he had a dream of Manjushri, Buddha coming through, telling him to you know, pursue the spiritual path. Another story is that uh, his mother gave him this traditional pre-king bath of like scalding hot water. And he says, why are you doing this? And she says, this is nothing compared to what it's like to be a king. And he's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, um, either way, he found himself as like a wandering yogi and made his way to Nalanda, which is a very famous um, institution of higher learning for Buddhism at that time. And he was actually not a really well-liked figure. Um, he would, um, they, some of the monks apparently said the only things he's good at, good at is, um, sitting and shitting. Um, so they were like, this guy, he just really doesn't know what he's up to. He just is not doing anything. He's not applying himself. I think one way we could like teach him a lesson is to ask him to give, you know, a big talk because giving a big talk, you know, that'll embarrass him and he'll realize he needs to apply himself to practice, but instead he like is like, okay, I'll give this talk and shows up and gives this like unbelievably clear, beautiful, fresh for the time teaching and then levitates up and disappears and no one sees him again. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what really happened there, but um, yeah, it's a really, it's a funny story. You know, other, other accounts say that he just, um, he just kind of took off after that. But this teaching has survived until now, right? And it's so interesting, especially being in the contemporary, like colonized science world. And we're like, we know everything is true and we prove it by science. I was like, I know if something's been true since eighth century, it's probably pretty true, you know, and true by people still use it and they still get benefit from it. So I, I really feel that kind of just unbelievable appreciation and gratitude for all the folks who allowed this text to be here today with us and for us. It's really, um, yeah, like those wisdom holders who we will never know, who dedicated themselves to practice, like that's how we get to be here. So I feel that generosity in this text. Um, yeah, and the first, the, the book comes in like kind of three parts. So the first the first three chapters are really kind of cultivating this heart of bodhicitta or this idea of how can we make the heart. So there's bodhisattva and bodhicitta, bodhisattva, the compassion warrior, and bodhicitta that we've talked about here a number of times. It's just that essence of the awakened heart for all beings. It's not the in the world warrior. It's like just that natural sense of like, I am here for all beings. And something we can definitely like cultivate and strengthen and um, something that's really at the root of our practice. So in the first couple chapters, it's really kind of getting us excited about bodhicitta and why this matters so much. And then the, the second part is to, and this, I have to say, these are my favorite chapters. They really directly to work skillfully with emotion reactivity and the wildness of our minds really wonderful metaphors coming out like the wild elephant of our mind. And um, really, I mean, I have been teaching emotion awareness and skills on emotion awareness for almost 15 years. And I like often quote this text. It's still super relevant. Uh, a lot of the instructions in here. And, and then, and that includes also these paramitas or these beautiful, skillful qualities of spiritual practice. The book goes through one by one. Um, and these are ways to kind of help us move beyond our self-centered natural way of being towards these more benevolent qualities of living uh, with and for others. And then the last, um, the last part of the book uh, is, so it's like, encourage our desire for bodhicitta, help us get everything out of the way that's preventing us from bodhicitta, and then like growing and flourishing bodhicitta. And the last traditional chapter of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life is actually resting in unconditioned openness. And Pema doesn't include it in this book. She's like, it needs its own book. So uh, we will, at that point, 
switch over to the the Dalai Lama's commentary. Um, so he has a wonderful book. There's a number of books and commentaries on the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, but it's, I think, really powerful to pair these kind of conceptual learnings and knowledge about becoming a compassion warrior with that taste of the unconditioned openness of our heart and mind. Uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, who... Um, we just finished his book, for many of you who, who know that, who were here and had an opportunity for him to teach with us. And he he said something so beautiful, I know I've mentioned it here before, but that when we can really recognize and see and feel through the practice of meditation, the emptiness of all phenomena, and in this case, he was describing being on a dark retreat, so in the kind of full immersion of a dark retreat for 49 days, you like, there's nothing to see, feel, smell, like you're just like, you, you really start to see that the mind creates everything. And you recognize like, wow, like nothing is actually happening and the mind is creating everything. So you see, feel, and know the emptiness of thoughts and feelings. And from that, you don't need to practice compassion. Compassion just naturally arises, or so he says. And I find that such an inspiring idea and I know for myself, and maybe some folks here have experienced this too, when you do have that clarity, spaciousness, and openness of mind, it's not like a blank, cold void. It is very warm. It is like, I think I said in the meditation, like our, our most pure natural state of awareness is compassion. So I think it's important that we practice that here together. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so then I want us to move into the very first couple verses. So the way that this book works is there will be a couple verses and then a couple commentaries, um, each per each, which is kind of a nice way to take it. And, uh, there's one, there's one part of the the guide to the Bodhisattva actually comes much later in the text, but is probably, you know, one of the most famous parts of it and something that's really good to keep in mind for this book, but also it's a beautiful way to kind of take refuge in your practice. And this is, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says he definitely practices this every day. And um, I have a different version of this I practice but I wanted to share this as kind of an opening for us entering on this book path together. Even if this is your only night doing it, no problem, but it's such a beautiful, clear way to capture the intention of what this whole book is for. And so this is, and now as long as space endures, as long as there are beings to be found, may I continue likewise to remain to drive away the sorrows of the world. And it's very simple, but especially when you think about the Buddhist context where you believe in many lifetimes and you believe that if you wake up in a lifetime, you can choose to not come back. Cause I mean, look at this place, <laughs> right? So it's like you actually wake up and achieve enlightenment. Like, and then you say, as long as there is space and as long as there are beings under that space, I choose to return. And the invitation to the, of the guide to the Bodhisattva is to, in some ways, encourage us to choose just that, that we will come back every single time, whether you think it's one lifetime or many lifetimes, to do this work. Like, as long as space remains, may I continue likewise to remain and drive away the sorrows of the world. So beautiful and so challenging. Like, just getting through this lifetime with all these sufferings, you know, feels like a, like already quite a lot. And the other, yeah, the other piece I, maybe on a personal note, at some point for me and of course, I'll never be able to test this scientifically, but I do think I chose to come back to be with the suffering of this world. And when that starts to kind of sink in and we feel like it is our sacred duty to be here, the practice becomes so alive, you know, so alive. So maybe that is something to um, look out for in your practice. Maybe that will come to you. Uh, 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 uh. So then... 
So yeah, the first four verses here are, are very traditional. These are um, in Buddhist teachings at this time, you kind of, you first express gratitude and respect. Then you make a commitment to the teaching itself. Then you express great humility and then you arouse confidence. So that's their formula. So the very first verse is, uh, to those who go in bliss, the Dharma they have mastered and to all their heirs, to all who merit veneration, I bow down. According to tradition, I shall now in brief describe the entrance to the Bodhisattva discipline. So this is kind of his his homage to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And he says um, what Pema Chodron offers is what's kind of unique about this is usually you talk about the Buddhas and, you know, the enlightened beings who have made anything possible. But the way Shantideva phrases it is it's um, to all those who go in bliss and to all their heirs, which is that. It's actually referring not only to the Buddhas who are already enlightened, but our own potential, each of us, to enlighten and to wake up. And that we can be free from hopes and fears of so and self-centeredness. Um, and so he's when he's bowing down to the Buddhas, it's not bowing down to something outside of himself. It's bowing down to that which lives in all of us. So I find that quite beautiful. Um, and then the second verse is, what I have to say has all been said before, and I am destitute of learning and skill with words. I therefore have no thoughts that this might be of benefit to others. I wrote it only to sustain my understanding. Mm -hmm. So this is like, uh, for those who know Buddhist texts, it's like this kind of very performative, like, oh, I'm nothing, I'm no one. But it's so, I mean, it's so nice to have humility. Not a very like common commodity in our day to day. <laughs> context no. let alone political stage um so it's really yeah it's a very it's a you know it's a beautiful um uh, idea and, and you will actually see this quite a lot even in contemporary monastics where you know you ask questions and very often um great teachers will say well like i'm just a humble monk like i don't know but maybe i'll share this and it's like like my glowing wisdom you know like really like okay um so he's doing that kind of hand wave though it's funny because i can imagine like here's all these people who truly think that he's destitute of learning and skill and they're like yes um and then the third verse he says my faith will thus be strengthened for a little while that i might grow accustomed to this virtuous way but others who now chance upon my words may profit also to equal myself in fortune. So this is the rousing of confidence, you know, this idea that um, if I can do anything that's of benefit to others, that this is absolutely worth it. And then he, he starts us off in the real kind of practice of the text by reminding us how precious it is, this, this human life this opportunity to be embodied in mind and heart, to be able to receive the teachings and transform. So this fourth verse is so hard to find ease and wealth and thereby to render meaningful this human birth. If I now fail to turn it to my profit, how could such a chance be mine again? So again, you know, this our ability to even receive teachings is ease and wealth. Um, and then, you know, I love this, what, what Pema says, she says, right now, even though our lives may seem far from perfect, we do have excellent circumstances. We have intelligence, availability of teachers and teachings, and some inclination to study and meditate. Some of us will die before the year is up. And in the next five years, some of us will be too ill or in too much pain to concentrate on a text. Moreover, many of us will become more distracted by worldly pursuits for two, 10, 20 years or the rest of our lives and no longer have the leisure to free ourselves from the rigidity of self-absorption. In the future, outer circumstances such as war and violence might become so pervasive we won't have time for honest self-reflection. This could easily happen or we might fall into the trap of too much comfort. When life feels too pleasurable, so luxurious and cozy, there's not enough pain to turn us away from worldly seductions. Lulled into complacency, we become indifferent to the suffering of fellow beings. 
The Buddha assures us that our human birth is ideal, just the right balance of pleasure and pain. The point is not to squander this human fortune. And it's, yeah, it's poignant. I think she wrote this book in, um, when is it? At least 20 years ago, maybe longer. Yeah, 2005. Eve, could you say the title one more time for us? Which version it is? Yeah, no time to lose. No time to lose. And um, yeah, just really, it is, <laughs> it is really hard to think of, you know, I'm so grateful for everyone in this room dedicating themselves to, to practice. It can feel really hard to do when there is so much suffering in the world and like kind of why and how. And what she says here is it might get even harder Right. And so this motivation and for sure, you know, many um, teachers and in, in various wisdom traditions do believe like this world is getting a lot worse in our lifetime. And so to be able to dedicate ourselves to these transformative practices for heart and mind so we can show up with compassion. Um, this is like his getting us really motivated to to do this together. Um, yeah, I'll, one more verse and then we'll call it for the night. So fifth verse is, as when a flash of lightning rends the night and its glare shows all dark black clouds had hid. Likewise, rarely through the Buddha's power, virtuous thoughts rise, brief and transient in the world. So this is kind of a, a diss on our human mind. But <laughs> so it's like, it's so rare that our mind, which is usually so deluded, actually has you know a virtuous thought arise <laughs> and um thus behold the utter frailty of goodness except for our perfect bodhicitta there is nothing able to withstand the great overwhelming strength of evil i don't know exactly what evil means here um and and emma says that these verses they're not meant to say what Shantideva believes that we actually are this kind of wretchedness of mind with just as bare lightning strikes of goodness. But this is how many of us view ourselves, right? And that we are kind of, wow, like it's, I don't know, this would be impossible to achieve for me. Um, and so this invitation to kind of look at how we, how we feel about our own minds, um, the point of view of the booties and they're like, she's saying, mm-hmm. Even the occasional glimpse, we hear this kind of talk coming from our own minds and from others. So instead of experiencing our hangups as solid and everlasting, we could believe this is just weather, it will pass. This is not the fundamental state. Um, and Pema Chodron's main teacher, many of you know, is uh, Chogyam Trumpa, And he has this very famous line, like, everything is workable. And even the own wretchedness of our mind. So it's a nice thought to end on. So let's take a moment here. So we do here to just reconnect with our practice, with our body, with our breath. And reflecting on the energy that it has taken to get here tonight and to be here tonight with one another. And the energy that might have been generated in personal meditation or reflection. And any insights that this text may just start to be revealing to us. And if it's comfortable placing hands together in front of the heart, symbolic gesture of offering from the heart. We imagine all of that accumulated energy of this evening as a force that we could dedicate out to all beings. And so considering this wonderful, outrageous bodhisattva activity and commitment, dedicating this energy that all beings of all times could be free from inner and outer harm that all beings of all times could know peace and ease 
and feel healthy and strong. That all beings of all times could be free. Thank you, everyone.